time for another episode of the Rubble Radio Podcast. This is Mark. This is Matt. And uh, that is the RubbleRadioPodcast.com where you can find all your Rubble Radio needs for our podcast. And this is a podcast, but we said that. That's right. If you don't know that this is a podcast, well, now you know. And knowing is half the battle. Good call, Garth. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, Pretty on wings. That's right. Man, uh, we are about three weeks, two weeks, I don't know. I don't even know what date it is. May 12th. Um, from Palooza 2023, where we will be there on Saturday at 2 o'clock doing a live Rubber Radio podcast presentation. Um, it's not our same format as this show is, so it's a little different when we do different, live shows. Yeah. But this year we're going to be talking Indiana Jones, The Greatest Adventure Story, as we look back on the life and, well, not the life, the legacy of Indiana Jones as a character through movies, television, comics, and video games, and why he is considered the greatest adventure story of all time. As uh, it's a big month for us on the shows, we'll be doing a lot of Indiana Jones starting with that Compalooza show and then talking Indiana Jones and Last Crusade. And we're hoping to top off the month of June with a look at the uh, new film Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. Um, so that's our plan anyway. The plans change, but that is our plan right now. That is the plan. But uh, Compalooza 2023 live at the George R. Brown Convention Center here in Houston, Texas, May uh, 26th, 27th, 28th. And um, we will be there that Saturday, like we said. I'm on a couple of panels that Sunday. Um, so come see us. Come say hi. Get a button and a sticker. And um, watch our show. We appreciate it. And see a lot of other cool stuff out there. Uh, the the uh, Captain Kirk himself, William Shatner, will be there. That's right. Um, they just announced Aaron Moriarty. I uh, probably butcher her last name. Play Starlight in The Boys. And I'm still disappointed that's not Carl Urban. To yeah. me, that's a weak substitution. <laughs> because, I mean... At least Carl Urban's known for a bunch of shit. She's been literally in, like, one show that she's known for. One, I think there's, like, a couple things that she starred in, but they're, like, you know, they're not the boys' <coughs> caliber or, like, pulp, you know, major pop culture caliber mm-hmm. stuff like like the boys um, yeah, or, you or can, Star Trek. You can go Lord say hi to, uh, you know, Mr. Homelander, weird ejaculating man himself, you know? Yes. Who drinks tit milk and, you know. Milk. And I mean, that's From your thing. From Adventures of Babysitting. That's right. Yep. If that's your thing, go talk to him. Anthony Starr, I think that's how you say his name. I don't you know, think there, it's Anthony. It's like Anthony. I will say I, I really appreciate his portrayal um, of Homelander and really making you just hate him for no <laughs> apparent reason. He's just an actor, but I feel like like he's an asshole. Like, yeah, it's I, like, damn you, man. Yeah. And uh, He's probably like a really nice guy. And I'm and like, mm, fuck you, dude. And Mick. <laughs> Mick. Foley, the great, is there, you know. Um, mankind, right? Mankind. He had two other Dude names. Love. Yeah, Dude Love. I mean, dude, this dude is an absolute legend in the wrestling industry. And uh, I heard he's one of those kind of celebrities that's really cool to meet, too. He's yeah. very nice. Um, so, so good stuff coming up. I think up. he was on Wife Swap one time. He might have been. And, and I, I saw him on, on an episode of Wife, like Celebrity Wife Swap. And he he seemed like a really cool guy. A dude, though, could take a beating in the ring and keep on ticking and had some great legendary battles in the WWE with a, you name it, he probably fought them in the ring. I mean, this Undertaker, guy. Undertaker, for sure. This guy is an absolute legend with Mick Foley, so come see him. Um, some comic book artists out there, too. Anime, all kinds of stuff is going to be out there. Um, a lot of My Hero Academia. Um, one, I know one Dragon Ball Z voice. Um, I think there's a, a couple Dragon Ball Z Kai voices. Of course, they they brought in new voice actors for Dragon Ball Z Kai, so there's a couple voice actors from that. Um, but most notable, Krillin's going to be there. He's probably the, the biggest name in Dragon Ball if you're looking for a Dragon Ball voice actor. <laughs> no Chuck Huber, unfortunately. I'm waiting for him to come back. Um, but, you know, n- nothing lately. He's so close. He's he's a Dallas resident. Yeah. Well, I he'd come by. You know, he's busy with the... Babies and stuff, I guess. Yeah, that's true. And, uh, but yeah, um, but so it should be a good time out there. You know, uh, this will be like our sixth, seventh straight year being there doing a show. Um, so it'll be fun. Uh, come see us <coughs> at Compalooza and um, come have a good time. Excuse this cough I've had. I, have a, I don't know. I feel fine. I just had a, a cough all week for some reason. It's probably going to blame the Texas pollen. That's there we go. Texas blame. pollen, man. And it's warm weather we've had. You can't avoid it sometimes, yeah. you know. It rained recently. The rain brings in, you know, weird crap all the time. You yeah. Know. It makes, like, everything, when it, and it's humid, so, like, everything sags, like your nut sacks and your elbows. <laughs> and it's like you get chafed, and it's just like humidity. miserable Texas weather, man. Yes. Um, 
and all that bullshit that if you live in Texas, you get used to it. That's a fucking lie because, no, it's not fun this time of the year. No. And we're in for it from now all the way through, pretty much through about September into October. So that's how long that humid, hot, sticky weather usually lasts. That's and true. Then, you know, and it is what it is. It is. And now that I've given man. everyone a description of sticky ball sacks, we move into the show. Yes. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and, uh, but. Uh, that, that's what you're here for in the Rubber Radio Podcast. Yeah, there will be so no much. sticky ball sack talk, though, at Compliz. We have to keep that show a yes, PG-13. PG-13. So, you know, and so so no worries there. It's safe to bring your children. Um, well, as safe as it can be. I can't promise that Matt won't, you know, throw his shirt off and jump up on stage or something. Hey, we get one F-bomb in a PG-13 movie. That's true. So, you know, you know can we trade that in for... You know, talks of leather ch- assless chaps like Frank uh, Frank did when we talked Mad Max. Oh, geez. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Old Frankster. Yeah. Man, and we might have to ring him back on the show one of these days. For real, man. Or not. Or I not, mean. yeah. Um, <laughs> and Frank's probably listening to the show. Fuck you guys. <laughs> but, you know, we love you, man. Yeah. And um, But, you know, I um, I watched a movie this week I, for years, wanted to see. And I, well... I did attempt to go see Guardians of the Galaxy 3 with the kids, and uh, I had a, um, a child problem, so I missed about an hour of it. So I really don't want to talk about it. I'm a little disappointed about that, because the hour I was watching, I was really enjoying it a lot. And um, and uh, then I caught the ending of it, and I'm not sure exactly how we got to the ending, but I'm a little disappointed in that. But uh, we'll talk about that more later whenever I get a chance to get around to actually seeing it through and through. Um, so that was a bit disappointing, but... So I moped in my sorrows by coming home and uh, <laughs> and that night and watched um, a John Woo film that I had never seen. This this is from 1990. So this is scrunched in between to give you a perspective of he made the killer and came out in '89, which is a classic, and then Hardboiled was of course '92. So he made this movie in between there called Bullet in the Head, and the reason it's I've never seen it. It's just it's simply hard to get a hold of in America. It's yeah. never appeared streaming anywhere. It's been on long out of print DVDs the Blu-rays you can get from overseas are extremely expensive even to import them and um, so it did finally get a decent Blu-ray release overseas a couple of years ago but it's still highly expensive but thank god we have bootleggers out there that want to bootleg these things there for American go. audiences and uh, Good old so I um, I did order a bootleg and I'm going to give the website a shout out sloppyseconds.com is the name of it if you're looking for some uh, bootleg material it's got a lot of good films on there you can't find anywhere else and so I ordered a copy of the Bullet in the Head, and it's a clean copy, even for a bootleg. I mean, you can tell they mastered this from a good source with the, with good subtitles. And um, it's it's weird because it's definitely a John Woo film, but it's also much different than The Killer or the Hardboiled. It's got the Woo action sequences. It's got the Woo... Does it have doves? Uh, uh, I can't remember. Probably. Probably. It's got the heroic bloodshed formula. But it's essentially about these three guys who... Are, are live in China and they, they want to do better for themselves and at any cost they're, they're just tired of living mundane lives and so one of them kind of gets involved a little bit with uh, with some mobsters and he does some runs for them and it turns into them killing this mobster kind of by accident to defend themselves so they end up basically going on the run to Saigon and getting into more trouble and more trouble with more gangsters and mobsters so essentially it's a story about these three men and their friendship's falling apart in the way the violence and the, the underworld affects them. Um, so it becomes this deeply personal story throughout the end of it, where at the end of the film, some horrible decisions are made by one of the guys. The great Tony Lung is in this, who's Ooh. fantastic. It's one of his best performances. And, and uh, it becomes this movie that seems so... Uh, I can see why it was controversial when it came out, because it seems so very simple on the surface but by the time you get through the two hour runtime of this film it becomes dark intense and and moving and deeply disturbing what these three men go through in these three hours and it takes place during the vietnam war so you also have this war backdrop going on around it nice um and it's it's a really quite a heavy film uh, compared to some of john woo's stuff i mean it it hits you in the gut and and it's it's just like wow that's that's an intense film and um I don't know if I like it. It's, I don't like. I mean, I know I don't like it better than The Killer or Hardboiled. Because those two are going to be always be my favorite Wu films. But this is up there and one of the best things I've seen him done. Uh, I mean, I might put it at number four or five. I think I got to go with Hardboiled first and The Killer, then A Better Tomorrow, then maybe Face Off, and then I might put this right behind it. So it might make it in my top five for John Wu films, and um, just just a, just a remarkably well done film. 
And um, I'm glad I finally got to watch it considering it's 33 years old and was finally able to see it because it's my favorite director of all time. And, and there's a few other of his films I haven't seen yet that are hard to find, like Just Heroes and uh, another another one I can't think of the name of off the top of my head. So, so um, But at least I got this one off the list of John Woo films, and I'm glad I did. And uh, just a solid film uh, that's worth tracking down, worth your time. And uh, I mean, it was only eight ninety nine sloppy seconds. Oh, that ain't bad. With shipping, it was like twelve bucks. Sloppy seconds dot com, sloppy second sales dot com. Sometimes they take a little bit of time to ship, but they're reliable because they they ship as they get orders placed. So sometimes if they're backed up. It takes a bit to ship, so it might take a couple weeks to get to you. But I've ordered three movies from them now. They've all showed up. They all work. So they're a very reliable bootleg site. Um, but Bull in the Head, man, definitely a, a cool film. Um, not one I'd necessarily know if we'd ever cover on the show because it's not accessible to everyone. Um, like I know likely we'll be doing a better tomorrow later this summer, possibly for my birthday movie, but a better tomorrow is a little more accessible than, uh, than bull in the head is. So I uh, definitely recommend watching it. And other than that, man, I watched, um, a couple more episodes of the bad batch this week. I'm getting into season two a bit and, um, that's about it, man. I didn't really watch a whole whole lot this week uh you know get ready for today's show unfortunately um but you know summer's coming a little more time baseball season's over hopefully i uh, have a little more time to watch some stuff and yeah. granted too, there hasn't been a whole lot i've really wanted to watch i i go find myself scrolling through netflix or amazon prime i'm like eh, eh, eh. Isn't yeah yeah that, that new jennifer lopez movie a netflix release the mother it might be yeah. or it's like just an you know, they're like, let's let's just strap Jennifer Lopez on with a bunch of guns and shit uh-huh. and have her shoot shit. You know, that's like, hey, it worked for, for Pam Anderson, you know. Yeah. It's like, it, it'll, it'll, work, it'll work for J-Lo. People will watch that. Yeah. Sometimes you need those, uh, you know, sometimes those filler action movies work do well whenever you have a stretch of a week or two. Right. Before, like, a major movie comes out, um, you know, and, uh, you know, maybe that's something people watch. I, I saw someone in our... A little movie group that we're in say that it was a big weekend for it, but I don't. I haven't seen much promotion for it. Yeah. Other than you know today, I think I saw some stuff on it today. No, I don't think there's much out in theaters this week with the uh, Guardian still playing well, and then I yeah. think the next big release is Little Mermaid, and then then uh, Spider Man after Fast that. Fast X. You know? And uh, even that, I'm like, yeah, that franchise, come on. It's like stop, dude. That's a that's a huge franchise, man. Oh, I know. It's, it's, it's the it makes, Lord of the Rings. That's the problem. It keeps making money because numb nuts keep going to see it. <laughs> like the one sitting to the left of me. <laughs> but I wait until it goes on voodoo. Yeah, well, I, have, I don't remember the last Fast and the Furious I've seen in theaters. The point. They're pretty forgettable after you watch them. Yeah. Not the first one, though. Hey, man, he was in my face. I'm in your face. Anyway. I live my life a quarter mile at a time. Quotable shit, just like the movie we're talking today. And no, nothing goes down quite like a quotable movie. I um, guess. For, for so what me, did you watch this week, Matt? Yeah, yeah. So I didn't watch a quotable movie, but I watched a very uh, a movie with a bunch of callbacks. And uh, I talked to you about it before, and that's uh, Evil Dead Rise. Um, I had wanted to see it uh, in theaters and had kind of put it off a little bit. Um, and decided that uh, I was going to go see it in theaters, um, that me and my wife would take turns. But then, uh, lo and behold, it comes out on digital release. Um, and I was like, you know what, let's just order the theater at home thing and, uh, and, and buy it and watch it. And uh, I wasn't disappointed. Uh, there's a good reason why it was originally approved for HBO Max release, but then given a theater release. And... I can tell you this movie has a lot of callbacks um, to the uh, the previous Evil Dead films. Um, going back to the first one where Sam Raimi got his big break. Of course, uh, I, I have a lot of uh, admiration for the Evil Dead franchise because, you know, Sam Raimi, he was really trying to get a start. Uh, you know, in, in the States, they wouldn't approve uh, Evil Dead to get released in the theaters. Went to Switzerland, did really well at a film festival. Then America... American film studios were like, man, you know, this is a good movie. Let's release it in the States. Evil Dead 2, Evil Dead Army of Darkness, Spider-Man, Darkman. You know what followed after that. So um, it's how he got his start. Um, of course, it stars his best friend, Bruce Campbell, as Ash. And uh, going into this movie, you know, there's uh, callbacks to Henrietta. Um, there's callbacks, of course, to the book, The Necronomicon. Um, but 
as you see in in a uh, little spoiler territory, I guess. Um, but it's been out in theaters for a while, so if you haven't seen it yet, um, you know, then too, you know, too bad. That. Too bad, man. Too bad. Uh, the the director um, said that this was actually there's three books in Army of Darkness that are on that pedestal when he has to recite the incantation, Klaatu Verata Niktu, and hopefully, hopefully. Uh, you know, by uttering those words, I didn't unleash uh, the evil from the book. You son of a bitch. You know, one of a, if, if one of us ends up possessed in the time of this recording, <laughs> then, you know, just remember that this was the greatest show you ever heard. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyways, um, the, so the, the theory is, uh, he says, is that this is one of those three books that are on that pedestal in, in Army of Darkness. Um, so uh, instead of your classical... Uh, cabin in the woods. This is an apartment complex, and you have neighbors. Oh, and, so uh, it's millennials. <laughs> it, no, millennials. No, they do a really good job of uh, not making it super generational. There's no uh, like, like kind of like Ch- Texas Chainsaw Massacre did, where they're like, You're, oh, "We're going to cancel you, bro." There's no dumb <laughs> stuff like that. Thank God. Um, they did this movie justice. Uh, like I said, there's a reason why they, they were like, well, this needs to get a theater release. Right. It's, it's like an old school horror movie. It's all atmosphere. It's all tone. Um, the cadence of the, the mother who is the deadite leader um, in this film. Um, and the way she gets possessed is, com- is reminiscent of uh, Evil Dead, Evil Dead 2, where the forest comes alive, grabs all of her limbs and stretches her apart and takes possession of her. That happens in the elevator. Um, there's, you know, blood everywhere. There's just... Yeah, he sent a text going, oh, yeah. or you can watch it you want. I'm like, why would I want to watch something I'm like this? I'm telling you, it, is, it, it had me kind of crawling. It had my <laughs> skin crawling. And I usually don't get that. Usually I, I watch horror films and, you know, I feel like it's uh, like I'm just kind of numb to some a lot of these horror films that come out. I enjoy them, but they don't make me scared or, or have my skin crawl. This movie did that. And it did it without jump scares. It doesn't use jump scares. That's the thing. There's no jump scares. It doesn't use them. It doesn't need it. And so it's it's a genuinely good horror film. And what... What really makes it is that a lot of it is is from the view of the children. So you're like, you're like, oh my god, the kids, you know, and, and you're you're kind of like on edge because of that. Um, so they did a really good job with with how they did the film. Um, if you want to download it, uh, you know, then you can pay the twenty or twenty eight dollars, uh, depending on how you want to do it, the rental or the buy. Or Mark, like you said, it may go to HBO Max in a couple weeks. Probably will. No, once you buy Matt, it's going to stream. Uh, yeah, so. it's it's kind of like wa- me washing like, my car. It's going to rain that day. Yeah, you know. You know? <laughs> I mean, that's just the way it's going to work. Yeah, I buy it. It's going to come out in a couple weeks. Like just like I'm looking, Bear. I know Creed Three is supposed to be going to HBO Max soon. I, I want to see that, and uh, I know you saw it. And then um, I heard uh, Dungeons and Dragons thing is going to be a Paramount Plus release pretty soon. Nice. Which I hope so because I want to. I kind of want to watch that too. Um, Dungeons and Dragons is a fun fun yeah. film. Um, I I think uh, I don't think it did as well in theaters as they wanted it to. No, but it is a it is a fun film. Right, I, I definitely miles better than the first one. Yeah, well that's not saying much. That was one of the yeah. worst adaptions ever made. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. I don't know about Evil Dead Rise. I'm not. Uh, I like my skin staying where it is. I'm yeah. not about you know <laughs> skin crawling uh-huh. and all that and the intensity of it. And you know I might be sucking my thumb by the time it's over and in a fetal position. <laughs> And I'm like, yeah, it's probably not not good for me. I, I decided to to buy the 2013 remake uh, as well because I, I realized I hadn't owned it. And uh, I put it on just to watch some of it, and Jake uh, came in from school. <laughs> and uh, it's like, that's not good. Yeah. It's, I didn't see all of that, but I saw enough of it because I was still married at the time, and she watched it. Yeah. And I'm like, why are you watching this? And she's like, I like it. I'm like, this is gross. So I know it was very yes. bloody. It, yeah, was there's like, a part where one of the girls gets possessed, and uh, they basically, these demons make the humans torture themselves. Yeah. And uh, this woman takes like a shard of glass. Yes, yeah, so I, I saw her, that part. And I'm like. Her face open to where it's like yeah. a big old. You know, almost looks like a, a smirk, but with her skeleton yeah, and showing like, in crap. Uh, that, yeah, she ex-wife was watching, and I'm like, nah, yeah. I'm good. I think I went to bed, let her watch. I'm like, no. Nah. Yeah, Jake walked in on that part, and he was like, oh, my God. Oh, I'm going to barf. <laughs> uh, 
Scar the Kid. Uh huh. But that was really about it. Uh, that's the only recent film that I've watched. Maybe maybe I'll watch uh, Fast X next week. I don't know. Mm. We'll save, see. Save your movie tickets. Yeah, it'll come out on yeah. Paramount. Yeah, or some one of them streaming services. Yeah. Yeah, I'd rather, Peacock. I'd rather save. Uh, I'm saving my my next movie will be Spider Man theaters. Um, oh, for thank sure. Thank goodness my daughter really is not interested in Little Mermaid. She even smart enough to say, "Dad, animated version is better." <laughs> well, I saw they they released a clip because there was you know some talk about how they changed the lyrics to to kiss the girl. Um, over sensitivity. Was it kiss the transgender? But yeah. sorry, <laughs> not, that wasn't sensitive. <laughs> yeah, I guess. But you know, it's weird to me because. Ariel is the one who wanted Eric, so it's like, how is it weird? She's pursuing him; he's not pursuing her. Because, how Matt, is it? Like, we have to you cancel know, everything. I know. Right? I should cancel the shirt you're wearing. I know it could be yeah, freaking Gallagher. I mean, yeah, it's like some you know booty hole probably made it. You know, I, mean, <laughs> so, I don't know. But they released a two minute clip of that uh, kiss the girl scene and it or kiss the girl uh, part in the movie, um, and it's like, like what's weird about it. Is like Ariel gets up and has to avoid Eric kissing her at one point, and I'm like, this doesn't make sense. You know, this doesn't seem like it follows the animated version at all. And you know, I think you know, whenever you have a movie that's that old and that's you know that many times watched, you have to follow it to the T. You know, pretty much religiously. Yeah. Well, I guess so. <clears throat> but then see people <clears throat> complained about Beauty and the Beast being followed to the T. So maybe they tried to change it. You know. People, when B and B's came out, they're like, "Oh, I already saw this animated version. It's the exact same thing." Yeah, you know. And then even Aladdin, they changed up just enough in the live action version, which is strangely directed by a guy who directed today's movie. Yeah, it's still weird to me that Guy Ritchie directed Aladdin. I didn't even realize that. And he might do Aladdin too. You know, they Return of Aladdin. Jafar. Wow. <clears throat> well, no, they're not going to adapt Return of Jafar. Apparently, it's going to be a, re- a new story. Ah. Uh, um. Yeah, it's weird that Guy Ritchie directed that. That is weird because he's he's an action. I mean, there's some action in there, yeah. You know where yeah. he's avoiding the palace guard, you know, and stuff, but not much. Not like Guy Ritchie action. There, you know, Aladdin doesn't pull out a fucking shotgun, <laughs> right? It says, "Blimey, you bloody fucking saucer!" <laughs> <laughs> Eat um, shit. <laughs> so we had this rumor going last week. Um, we're going to jump into a little news before we get into the the feature film. Uh, yeah. That Adam Driver was cat is the leading for Reed Richards in the Fantastic Four. So a report came out this week that he has accepted the role in the MCU, even though Marvel Studios not said anything yet. Um, but it seems ninety five percent legit that Adam wow. Driver is going to be Reed Richards. Um, you know, I love Adam Driver; he's yeah. great. But but I don't see him as Reed Richards. It, it, maybe it's because they tease us with John Krasinski and. In the Doctor Strange film, and he looks like, and he looks like Reed Richards. Yeah. Um, so maybe that's what it is. Uh, I'm, I'm obviously no Adam Driver is perfectly capable of pulling it off because oh, he's yeah. a fantastic actor. Um, but maybe in my fantasy cast, it's not what I would pick. But the good news in this that I think is that the Fantastic Four movies finally starting to come together because I think this is with the with the MCU lately. Um, we we know it's been lacking a little bit since No Way Home. Now Guardians Three is great, even though I get, didn't get to see all of it. I know over universally it's pretty great. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think the Fantastic Four is a movie that the MCU desperately needs right now, and it needs to be really well done and really good. We need these characters of Doctor of Doctor Doom and Reed Richards and Sue Storm and, and Johnny Storm and the Thing Ben Grimm to introduce this universe because. They're so important to the world that Stan Lee created. I mean, they really are. They're, they're the original Marvel family. Yeah. Um, and, and it's so good that Marvel's able to get the rights from Fox because I think this is a really important step if the MCU is to continue to survive yeah. theatrically for many more years. And if they want to keep going cosmic, you right. kind of have to get the Fantastic Four involved. Yeah. And it's very difficult. I knew when they were starting this project, it was going to be very difficult to keep... Robert Downey Jr. and Chris Evans and, and Scarlett Johansson, all these actors and actresses together for many years. And we see that now. They, they committed to these films for 15 plus years. They're ready to move on. So you need a new group to come in and fulfill these roles and fulfill important parts of the MCU as the Avengers have moved on. We have new Avengers. And I so I believe that Fantastic Four is very important to that. Um, possibly the most important right now until we get to the X-Men. For sure. You know? and, and, and I think another one's important is the rumor that 
Marvel and Sony are working to fast track Spider-Man 4 and get it moving quick because they realize Spider-Man is very important to the story as well. People want to see what happened after No Way Home with Peter losing his memory. Um, so I, it, it appears that that we could get another Spider-Man film as early as next year, that they're really trying to get this moving quick. Because I think they're starting to realize like they've taken a step backwards and we, we need some big stuff. You yes. Know? But let's get going. And the Marvels doesn't look super promising. I think they've got a great soundtrack. Um, but I, I don't think it's it's going to be one of those movies. I think it's going to be like an Ant-Man and Wasp. You know, Ant-Man 2. It's going to be like an Ant-Man 2 movie where it's just a movie. Maybe it, you know, introduces you to another element of the MCU, but it's going to be one that you probably watch once or don't right. watch at all. Because um, it's like, I feel like Ant- Ant-Man 2, I, I feel like there's a lot of people who just didn't watch it. Like, I haven't seen Ant-Man and Wasp Quantumania yet. I will watch it next week when yeah. it's Disney+. Plus. Um, you know, so, but I haven't watched it yet. Um, so, yeah, I know you're right. I think it's important to MCU gets these big movies going um, that people want to see. Um, you know, uh, Jenna Ortega seems to be Tim Burton's new female version of Giant Depp as he's worked with her on Wednesday. And now it's... Uh, She's cats, you know. She's gonna be in Be- Beetlejuice too. Um, first, do we need a Beetlejuice too? Probably not. You know, it's like when we when we did the se- when we did when we covered it on the show. I hadn't rewatched it in years, and it was really hard for me to watch. I felt it didn't hold up as well. I pr- we talked about this. When we did the show. I appreciate it as a classic. I get it's it. A cult classic. It's yeah. a cult classic. I appreciate what Burton did, and, and I appreciate Keaton's performance and all that. But I don't ever need to watch it again. Exactly. Beetlejuice is not a classic. I'm going to revisit. Um, like Indiana Jones or Star Wars, any of the other classics from the 70s and 80s. Um, so I feel like this is one movie we don't need a legacy sequel to, but fans disagree with it. There are fans out there that want it. And Defoe was cast. Yeah, William that yeah. William Defoe was cast today. Um, He's going to be like the police of and, the other world. And, of course, whatever. Michael Keaton has been talking up a little bit in some interviews and saying that Beale Juice is going to look exactly the same. There's no new look for him. Uh, and this goes into production pretty soon because uh, they want it for release next year. Um, so Beetlejuice 2, it's been rumors for a long time that it was coming, and now it's uh, finally on the way. Um, and I'm sure it has its fans. I just, um, one that I don't feel I need this movie, and I um, I may see it eventually, but I'm not going to go to the theater and see yeah. it. You know, it's like, nah, I'm good. Uh, so we had some news last week on Babylon 5 being re brought back into animated film. So this week, J. Michael Straczynski, the creator of Babylon 5, gave a little more details. It's called Babylon 5, The Long Road Home. And it's going to be uh, kind of a realistic animation style, uh, not so much cartoony like other Warner Brothers stuff. Mm -hmm. And almost all the original cast that's still alive is coming back for the voices, which is incredible. Um, And Trzynski also revealed that in mid-June we'll get a trailer, we'll get a release date. It is coming this summer, um, and uh, that Warner Brothers is very much behind it. But Trzynski... Interesting. He went to the original cast members, Bruce Boxletter and, and and Claudia Christian, and the ones who are still alive. And he asked him, "Hey, if I recast the roles of our fallen uh, cast members, are y'all okay with that?" And if one of them had said no, he wouldn't have done it. Wow. Out of respect for them, and they all happily said yes that they would honor, they want to honor their memories. And so we're getting a Babylon Five animated film, and I'm super excited for this. Um, straczynski has been is very active on Twitter. He's really good with his fans and talking to people and. He's given a lot of information that he can give, and, and he seems really excited about it. And um, so it's going to be cool. I'm definitely looking forward to watching this when it comes out this summer. Uh, he didn't give her the exact release date, but they did set coming this summer. So imagine the trailers in mid June. This thing's probably going to be available in July or so to watch. Um, so for Babylon 5, coming back after 20 plus years since it's wow. been on screen with years. an animated film, one of my, um, not one of my, probably is my favorite science fiction series. I've ever watched, um, and I've I've gotten on you a few times. Like Matt, give Babylon Five a chance, man. What's it streaming on? It's again? on Tubi right now. Tubi, and uh, I don't know if it's the remastered versions, but I know it's on Tubi and Pluto TV. It was on HBO Max for a while because you know it's obviously Warner Brothers. And yeah, it may show back up on HBO Max eventually. Um, now the movies that tie in aren't there, but if you make it through the series, I will let you borrow my box set with the movies on it so you can see all the the uh, sub movies. Nice. Because uh, the only really important one you need to watch is. It, in the beginning uh, and once you make it through season four and then you watch in the beginning it's one, it's kind of like 
Remember when you watched those last six episodes of Clone Wars and how they tied in with episode three and you were blown away? Yeah. That's how in the beginning is. Okay. He, he does this amazing prequel film, but also ties in with current events of the show, and you're just like, wow, this is incredibly written. How this all ties in together. Um, so, so it's really well done. Um, so highly recommend it, man, uh, as uh, watching Babylon 5 if you've never seen it. I know I give you a hard time about Breaking Bad and some other shows, but if I had to pick <laughs> one for you to watch, I would watch Babylon, Babylon. 5. Um, as a science fiction fan and just important to the genre that to watch it, you know. So I highly recommend watching that show. And um, but that's it for the news, man. Uh, so today's featured film comes from Guy Ritchie, and uh, who, yes, Matt, he directed Aladdin. He didn't even know it. Um, <laughs> and uh, he, this is a guy who made his debut with a film called Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels, which is a lot of fun to watch too. And uh, we, but we chose to go with Snatch because ideally it's a little more popular. Um, maybe not his most popular film because of, box office wise, because Aladdin made a lot of money. Uh, he's had a couple other hits, uh, you know, over the years. But but Snatch was the film I think for a lot of people our age that put him on our map. Yes. For Guy Ritchie, we saw this. It, it, you know, Brad Pitt was such a huge fan of Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels that he asked for a part in this film, and 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 Guy Ritchie wrote him he. Brad Pitt couldn't do the London accent thing, so he wrote him the part of Mickey the Gypsy and just for Brad Pitt, who he pulls off awesomely in this. I mean, this entire cast is fantastic in this film. When, and, Pitt, when Pitt first called him, he's like, yeah, yeah, I got a part for it in, in, in the part for you in the movie. Then they realized there was no part for him in the right. movie. He had to create the, uh, uh, the uh, Pikey, right. Pikey part. I mean, from Jason Statham to Alan Ford to Brad Pitt, everyone in this film, this cast is it's fantastic. Yes. Um, and, and it's so many different stories going on, and, and it all comes together. And uh, Benicio Del Toro's in this film. And the, the whole story comes together. Just when you think it's a chaotic film, it all just kind of comes together yes. and wrapped up really nicely. And, and that's just the brilliance of Guy Ritchie's storytelling in this film. Um, and it's this is a difficult movie to summarize. I'm going to let you take a shot at it. Yeah, so... We start off with a bunch of rabbis uh, robbing a jewelry store. <laughs> Benicio del Toro is heading him. He takes basically takes this diamond to the head and tries to see how he can sell this. He calls his cousin uh, Vinny or Vin or Avi, cu- t- cousin Avi or something like that, I think. Mm-hmm, and so he goes to London to go and sell this thing to uh, a Russian guy, um, the knife. Uh, Forget his name, but he's the knife, and uh, he can get you a gun, whatever you need. This guy convinces uh, Benicio del Toro's character, Freddy Fourfingers, to basically go use this on a bet uh, with some bookies, mm-hmm. uh, because there's only one, you know, a couple places that'll take that kind of bet. And while he's doing that, he convinces some other people to rob him while he's going to go make this bet. All the Bullet while, Bullet Tooth Tony. Bullet Tooth yeah, Tony. Was it your name? And uh, so, um, while this is going on, you've got uh, you've got Turkish and Tommy, and uh, they are boxing promoters, and they want a caravan. So they, that's how they enter Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt's part of this cult of gypsies or pikies, as they call them, and they sell him a bad caravan um, because he says you brought Gorgeous George with you, this boxer that's supposed to box for them, and he's a massive dude, and you did it to send a message so they're going to fuck with you because you sent someone over there to so that they wouldn't fuck with you or fuck with you anyways. And uh, so they say, you know what? If you want your money back, you're going to have to fight us for it. And he, <laughs> he knocks out Gorgeous George in one hit because he's a champion bare knuckle boxer. Right. Um, and then we get into Flat Top. and uh, Brick Top. Brick Top. Played by uh, the dad from Big Fish. Colin Ford. Yeah, <laughs> which is like weird me seeing him in this role because he feeds people to pigs. So while this is going on, this this uh, fight promotion, this boxing promotion, this diamond now switches hands to the thugs um, that the Russians sent to go intercept with uh, Benicio Del Toro. Um, and the scene is just hilarious. It's it's based off of some, some late-night TV's worst <laughs> criminal heists. And uh, they do all kinds of things wrong. They try and kick the door open when really they could have just pulled it the other way. But, um, you know, and then they they eventually get the diamond from Benicio Del Toro, even though he's not in 
the bookie's place. They run into the van, accidentally lock him in the van, and then they see him get out, get the diamond, they bring it back, um, and, uh, you know, then enter the boxing fight. Um, Mickey, uh, played by Brad Pitt, of course, knocks out the guy in one hit. He's supposed to go down in the fourth round, you know, <coughs> and they get into some trouble there. Um, the diamond um, is then tried tried to get reconfiscated by uh, to, uh, Cousin Avi, <laughs> and the dog somehow eats it, gets out the window. And then that's the, a hilarious scene where yes. he tells Spool to Tony, well, open the dog. This is this tough guy who kills people. Yeah. He's like, what do you mean open the dog? Like, well, yeah. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but yeah, he'll kill people. Yeah, he'll kill people. He doesn't want to open the dog. Um, the dog gets away. And then Bullet Tooth gets, shot, tooth on gets accident. shot on accident by a fucking Desert Eagle. Uh, <laughs> it kills him. And so he, Tony, A.B. goes back to the States. He's like, screw this. Screw <laughs> this. I ain't dealing with this no more. Um, after they, the uh, Bricktop tries to force Mick to fight again. He doesn't want to fight because he got to take care of his mom. So he fucking burns down the caravan with his sleeping mom in it to force him to do it. And so Mick eventually, uh, Mickey eventually agrees to fight just to make sure no chaos happens. And he puts all money, part yeah, of the plan. all part of the plan. He puts money on himself, goes down, makes the other guy go down when he needs him to go down, so he makes his money. And when Bricktop tries to kill him, Turkish and Tommy for it, all the his pikey brothers just fucking Take all execute out. all of them, uh, shoot them all down, and then move their campsite by by the morning. And then what happens whenever Turkish and Tommy go to the campsite? The dog shows up um, while they're being questioned by police while they're there. He's like, we're, walk- we're watching we're walking the dag. <laughs> the dog. The pikey's called right. the dag. You like dags? <laughs> dags? What? Dogs. Dogs. <coughs> um, but, uh, yeah, they end up with the dog. And they're passing Sol, Vinny, and, uh, and uh, Al- Albert, Alfred, uh, I forget, uh, Tyrone. Tyrone, yeah. Vinny, and Sol. Um, the three guys that tried to hold up uh, Freddy Four Fingers that lost the dog in the first place, and they're like, "Oh, the dog!" But they're getting pulled over by police. Right, they have a dead body. They've got a dead body in the back of their trunk, so they get arrested. They're going away, and then Turkish tells Tommy he can keep the dog as long as he takes him to the vet, and then the vet finds the diamond in his stomach. Right, and so here you are, back full circle with the diamond, the dog, and he's the. They they're going to the head again with this diamond, so the head sees the diamond again from them, not from Freddy Four Fingers because he's fucking dead, <laughs> got his head blown off, and uh, and he's like, I know a guy who knows what to do with this. He calls Cousin Navy. And, and he goes back to London. Goes back to London. <laughs> the, uh, the end. The end. So and, uh, it's that's hard to explain. I gave you. But a you know lot that's of why I let you keep going because normally whenever you do these long. Um, Summaries. I, I cut you off, but this. But I wanted you to keep going because it was as chaotic as the movie. Is. Yes, it is. Is very but, chaotic. But, uh, but yet, <laughs> this movie is crazy like that. But yet, it all makes sense. It all comes together nicely. I wouldn't even call it a twist ending because by the time you get to the ending, you're like, well, that makes sense. Yes, it doesn't even feel like a twist ending. You're like that. That Mickey and his crew had a plan the entire time. They were playing them. They were playing Bricktop and Turkish and, and all the entire time. The whole time. And, and the, the great thing about makes this movie work is, too, I think, that that the actors are in this buy into the craziness of Guy Ritchie's story and his direction. And so the acting across the board is so solidly well done. Yes. Um, you know, it, it doesn't seem silly at one point. It does have some legitimately funny moments that make you kind of laugh. But it also, it's, you take it very seriously because there's death of the movie even when bullet tooth gets killed you're like well that's kind yeah, of messed man. up it's kind of funny but kind he's, of like he's got a good character intro uh-huh. and he's you know hilarious he it just like, gets snapped off like he, that yeah man and uh he's you like him in the role he's appeared in quite a few films oh, yeah. gone in 60 seconds he was in that film great tough guy you yeah. know uh, on screen but uh but yeah you're like oh man this sucks you boris know? the blade he that guy has been in a lot of movies too as yeah. a character actor uh, and and then, then you start out with, with Jason Statham, who has, over the years, has become known as, like, you know, a tough guy, movie, roles like uh, guy. The, the Meg and, and some the mechanic and some movies he's done. But, like, he's legitimately really good in this movie. Yeah. You almost feel like this is a guy who was going to, his career was going to take off to maybe bigger things than, than, than action films. Like, he was going to be, like, this crime guy. 
Um, but his career didn't necessarily take off that way. And that's not to say that Jason isn't good in his movies, but he eventually became that guy in every movie. Yeah. But but as Turkish in this, he's really good. Uh, Brad Pitt's amazing in this movie. And this is that streak that Brad Pitt was having in his career there where he was in 12 Monkeys and, and, and you know, Snatch and just a lot of really good roles he was playing. And to, and to this day, Brad Pitt, you know, has won Oscars now for his roles. He continued to just become a better and better actor as he got older. And, and he's great in this role as Mickey. He worked really hard on the accent. It's ridiculous. You can't understand half of what he says unless you're really listening. Yes. Um, but but it's wonderful. Um, you know, and I, and I like his role a lot. This movie's very quotable, too. It's very quotable. Shut, shut up, you big bald fuck. <laughs> you know? And then Feed You to the Pigs. Um, man, I, I like, too, where they're talking to Bolt Plutoni. And he goes, because your gun says replica, and then the camera shows replica. Yes, and mine says Desert Eagle, and that's why I know you're not going to do a damn thing to me or whatever. Yep. <laughs> and uh, the fucking fake guns. He's like, "Who's going to notice?" And they notice. Yeah. And then after they they get the diamond, who's who's gonna who's gonna come up on us? Well, fucking bullet two Tony's gonna <laughs> right. come up on up on your ass. They they're so dumb, which is you know is is a testament to these these dumb criminals that guy Richie saw on television. Yeah, you know they almost they they almost had Sean Connery. Sean Connery wanted to read the script, um, and he uh, he let Sean Con Richie let Sean Connery read the script, and he's like, "This is a damn good movie, but you can't afford me." <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think man. he was gonna play Bricktop. Oh, that would've been cool, dude. That he would have been really good. And uh, how and Dennis Farina plays cousin Ivy. I mean, he's so good in this. Yes, um, one of his better roles. You know, he and. Uh, Alan Ford was brick top. Alan Ford was not in Big Fish. You're thinking of um, they look alike. I know who you're talking about. It's not. It's not the no, same guy. No, no. Uh, Big Fish is. Um, I can't think of the actor's name, but but um, I'd have to look it up. But Alan Ford Man, he looks has so been around like a long him. time too. Been a lot of character actors, movies, and stuff. I mean, Alan Ford was the taxi driver in American Werewolf in London. I mean, he's been around a long time too. And uh, but just how? But this cast is just amazing. Guy Ritchie, Albert Finney, Albert Finney. That's yeah. right. Get, got Richie's direction, um, and the work in the editing room of this film is amazing. The way they do snatch, it was able to pull all this together and tell a good story. Um, it's definitely, you know, Guy Richie definitely comes from the Quentin Tarantino pulp fiction school. You know, we had a lot of directors in the late nineties, early two thousands. About tried, the beginning of this film, well, just in general, trying to copy that style that yeah. Tarantino did. Reservoir Dogs, and, and Guy Richie has talked. He's mentioned he's very influenced by Tarantino and things and, he did. And I think he was trying to say it at the beginning of the film. Right. You get Reservoir Dogs are talking about like a virgin with Madonna, and then in the beginning of this film, they're talking about the word virgin and what it means mm. in the Bible, and, and the, the fake rabbis are having this conversation. Um, right. And then, of course, they have Lucky Star, which they paid a million dollars for, a song by Madonna. Oh, yeah. I think this was kind of like a little love letter to Quentin Tarantino. That's my opinion. But Richie also very much has his own style, too. Yes. As much as he is influenced by Tarantino, it doesn't feel like he tries to copy him. No. I mean, no. you'd watch Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels, watch this, even watch um, the one he did with Matthew McConaughey that I just watched. I can't think of the name of the gentleman. The gentleman, you know, and, and Guy Ritchie definitely has his own style and his own groove and his own vibe to his films. Yeah, um, which I think is a good thing. And, and Guy Ritchie, for a long time, has been a director that I think has so much potential to just uh, be more than kind of a cult director he is. You know, I always felt like this guy could have done a lot. So he's got a movie out right now called The Covenant, I yes. think, and uh, you know, and. Uh, I, um, and I hope his career continues to, thr to thrive and do some good stuff. I still haven't seen his King Arthur movie he made a couple years ago with with um, fucking Pacific Rim Boy. Uh, oh, Sons of Anarchy. No, Sons of Anarchy guy. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you're talking about. Uh, and uh, he dude. was at Compalooza a couple years ago. But uh, you know, but I, but I, um, but but Snatch is probably my favorite movie he's done. I like Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels a lot too. Um, And uh, but this movie just has so much going for it. It's a it's a lot of fun to watch. Uh, you know, he, he also did the two Sherlock Holmes films. Guy Ritchie did, which were both he fun. did. That's right. And those are both fun movies. Yeah, I, I like uh, Robert Downey Jr. And yeah, I want to see Wrath of Man with uh, our boy. We just talked about Statham. You Statham. know, and it's on Amazon Prime. Charlie Hunnam. Yeah, yeah. Tra and um, you know, the Man from Uncle I still haven't seen just because. I want to because it's Henry Cavill, but I kind of had stayed away from it because of the Army Hammer controversy. Oh. I just hadn't wanted to watch it, but I, and and because you know he had planned for 
the Man from Uncle the Bee kind of a franchise, and the yeah. whole Army Hammer thing hit, and it's like, okay, well, that kind of ruined it. Uh, Rock and Roll, that's actually really good with um, Gerard Butler. Shit, he's even done a Madonna movie video, music video, Guy Ritchie has, back right after he did Snatch. You know? Yeah, and, and uh, what you call it? Guy Ritchie, man. He, he did have Matthew Vaughn produce this film. Yes. And Matthew Vaughn were good buddies, and they kind of had that same style. Like, if you go watch some of Matthew Vaughn's early stuff, like Layer Cake, it's, yeah. it's in the same kind of vein of this uh, this Tarantino-ish crime wave sagas. Not sagas. Crime wave movies that kind of came out at this time. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of films like this. Some of them weren't so good, and some of them were really good. Like, Snatch is really good. But, like, Layer Cake, I think it's okay. I don't think it's quite Snatch level. It's not bad. Um, it's not one of Matthew Vaughn's best. Uh, where Snatch, I think, is right up there with one of Guy Ritchie's best. Um, you know, uh, but there were a lot of movies like this back in that day. And it's like, he made a really good, in this movie, it's it's very rewatchable. It's a very rewatchable movie. It's when you when you think about a rewatchable movie, what makes it, um, you know, what makes it rewatchable? Comedy. And and comedy can fade over time, but this one, I feel like the comedy and aspect in this one holds up. Um, the quotableness movies fairly quotable. Mm -hmm. um, there's good action. The action holds up, and uh, yeah, I, I thought I just thought it was great that he raised seven million dollars after Lock, Stock, and Barrel, um, paid one million for the rights for Lucky Star, and then spent the other six million um, on the movie. Apparently, he didn't spend a whole lot of money uh, on food because <laughs> uh, on on set the uh, actors were filmed. Um, and outtakes uh, saying that they were given like economy biscuits and stuff, and they had they were lucky to get like potato sandwiches, <laughs> and the, apparently the food wasn't like super Hollywoodish, um, and uh, he got uh, Richie got his taste of Hollywood actors uh, too because Benicio he said that he was gonna film or he he was gonna act how he wanted to act, and when Richie said no, this is how you're gonna play the character. He completely ignored Richie and, and acted uh, with Freddie Fourfingers the way he wanted him to be acting, which that I think is fine. surprise me because I've heard Del Toro has done that before. Yeah. I know Robert Rodriguez talked about him being a little difficult to work with on Sin City. Mm -hmm. You know, want him to do, want to do I, and I don't think Del Toro is an actor that's not Val Kilmer level hard to work with, but I yeah. think Del Toro has been the kind of actor he's going to do it the way he's going to do it, and that's it. You yes. know? Um but, you know, Snatch, I think, is um, just a movie that, for 20 years later, it holds up extremely well. Uh, it's a it's a well-done film with a great cast. Um, some good moments. And Lenny Jones actually hit himself in the privates for real with a shotgun. Oh, and yeah. He, and he stayed going through that scene. Yes, they um, kept it in because it was so funny. <laughs> most of the deaths in the movie are off-screen, which is interesting. And and they also, most of the deaths seem to happen by accident, other than at the end when the gypsies decide to kill Bricktop and everybody. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's some interesting things there. Um, there's some really... The thing with the pigs is actually true. If you can train pigs to to do that, they actually really will eat through human bone and yes. stuff. Um, but don't... You've got to be suspicious of pig farm. Yeah, so don't... But don't try that at home, kids. Yes. Um, but... Uh, yeah, you know, um, just a movie that I think it should be watched. If you never, you know, it's one of those movies you might have seen on Saturday matinee. Didn't yeah. realize you saw it. You know, it's that's been how it a was while. for me, man. I saw bits and pieces of this movie, and I always remember the part uh, mm -hmm. where you know, a bullet tooth sees the replica on the side of the guns. <laughs> yeah, because that was that's just super iconic, very iconic scene. Um, but this was like, I think this is the first time I've watched it all the way through without catching it in the middle of playing or just after it started playing and uh you know i enjoyed it i enjoyed it it's a it's a film i may go back and watch again um and uh you know always nice to see a guy rich i always like the scene my favorite one of my favorite scenes is the scene that introduces the young bullet tooth and he gets shot what do you mean he got six up six times at one time and he lived yeah and he keeps shooting him won't you fucking die <laughs> and he just keeps killing him um just just a good classic scene um, but man, a, a, definitely a good film. Highly recommend. And uh, this and Lock, Sock, and Two Smoking Barrels, Sky Ritchie's first two films, uh, both really good movies. A lot of the same actors are in both films. Yeah. Um, but really well done. 
and uh, I'm going to try to watch his uh, Wrath of Man with Jason Statham, and and uh, I'm not sure I haven't seen much about the Covenant. I know it just hit. It looks like a war movie. Yeah, yeah, you know, it looks like a war movie. Well, and that's a cool thing. Guy Ritchie definitely has a range, you know, from doing crime films like this to doing Aladdin to doing Sherlock Holmes, which are crime movies of a different sort because they're period films. Yes, you know, and then the King Arthur, which is a um, period piece as well at a different time. And uh, so you know, he definitely definitely a range with him as a as a director. Um, but definitely check out Snatch if you've never seen it. I enjoyed watching it this week too. Been a while since I had seen it. And, uh, it could it could arguably be Brad Pitt's best role. You could make an argument. I don't think it's his best role. I think maybe it's. I think it top was three, four, top three or four. I think it might have been his best role until Once Upon a Time in Hollywood came out. Yep, because he's so good as stuntman Bob in that. Is it Bob? Was that his name in it? I thought I thought it was Rick. Rick, yeah. No, yep. Rick is um, oh, is uh, Leo Leo's character because he's Rick Dalton. Now I have to look it up. God dang it! Damn it! Yeah, now we're gonna have to find that. Out. And it's like I don't think it's Bob, but Cliff. It, it, Cliff Booth, Cliff Booth. Booth, Cliff Booth. Yep. I think Cliff was probably his best performance until, but Snatch was right up there until then, and uh, you know, but, you know that's a good argument though. You could argue make an argument for Snatch for sure. Um. But he was really great as Cliff, especially that final scene in the movie. Oh yeah! When the kids come in the house and he's just like, "Fuck all you motherfuckers!" <laughs> so, all right, well, let's get into this week in pop. It's that time of the month for this week in pop culture history, as we look back on movie and pop culture events for the month of May. Yes. So, this month, pop culture history, 1960, Elvis Presley appeared on a Frank Sinatra television special where he sang. One of Sinatra's songs, Witchcraft, and Sinatra sang one of his songs, Love Me Tender. Uh, so I thought that was pretty cool. That's we cool. don't talk a whole lot of music here. No. Um, but, you know, the the Presley movie uh, won uh, an Oscar uh, this year. So, yeah, I figured yeah. I'd mention the Elvis. That's cool because you know, I've been not a huge Elvis kick since I saw the movie, but I've jammed a little Elvis since then and, and gotten a little... I've always appreciated him, but I haven't really taken the time to listen to him. You know, yeah. you know the songs if you hear them. And, um, you know, man, the, you hear it from a different light after you see the film and you appreciate it. And uh, lyrically, man, Elvis was pretty good. Yeah. You know, he uh, some of his songs were pretty deep and some deep means. He had the fun songs, too, like Jailhouse Rock and stuff. Yeah. But uh, but but the guy's really good. And, uh, and you know, Austin Butler, man, uh, was great as Elvis. And that kid's going to go a long way. Yeah, he's got a future ahead. Yeah. Uh, we talked about Quentin Tarantino, 1994, this month, Pulp Fiction, released in theaters. I mean... Really, it was a May release. Yeah, it was a May release. I guess that makes sense, because I think it played at the Cannes Film Festival. That's the one. It's, so, it, this yeah, is, but, yeah, but I don't think it came out in theaters until later in the year. So that's what well, it was. It, debuted, it, premi- debuted it premiered at Cannes Cans about this time Cans. of the year, that's right. and I think it came out in theaters in the fall. Um yeah, man, it's 1994. I mean, classic. I mean, probably, would you say that Pulp Fiction is one of the, let's say 1990 and up. I know you have Jurassic Park and Terminator 2, um, but it might be up there top five modern classics. Easy. You know. Easy in that era, yeah. And uh, from that era, I mean, easily. Uh, it, definitely one of the most influential modern films of all time. Big time. I mean, the movie we just talked about, heavily influenced by lot, Pulp Fiction. Yeah, there probably you can probably find a, a dozen movies where they and, made some kind of Yeah, and a movie that holds up extremely well, extremely disturbing in part still, <laughs> you know, some of the subject matter, but, but uh, definitely a classic. Uh, 1962, Marilyn Monroe sings Happy Birthday, Mr. President to JFK. Yeah, before 15,000 attendees. So I was like, I had, I had to mention that because I that's freaking iconic as hell. I mean, I do, Marilyn. Marilyn I mean, you know, I, so I don't know what else to say about that, but uh, I have no interest in watching the... We know he was the, sneaking her around oh, in those yeah. tunnels, man. And I have no reason to watch the movie that came out on Netflix. That just sounds weird and boring, but, but yeah. you know, Marilyn, hey. Hey, yeah. You know. We understand. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to do all of these at once. The prequel... And the original trilogy, all released in May. Star Wars, baby. May the 4th be with you, buddy. Yeah, I always thought it was interesting the sequels were Christmas releases instead because Star Wars was so traditional for Memorial Day. But, uh, you know, um, you know, we just had the 40th anniversary of Return of the Jedi. Well, it's, it's coming, and the movie's played in theaters. And, yeah. 
and uh, Empire was a couple years ago, and Star Wars is approaching its 50th anniversary here in uh, about four years, and, um, you know, the prequels were a big deal. People tens standing out in line. Uh, yeah. I told the story before on the show that I got to go see The Phantom Menace 11 days early through the Star Wars fan club. They sent me tickets, and I'm getting to walk people past at Tinseltown right here where we still go see movies, Matt, 20, 30 years, almost 20 years later. And these people are sitting in tents, and I'm all like, I have so what tickets. Y'all are dumb ass to sleep out here in tents waiting for a movie of all things. For real. Um, but that was cool, man. Uh, yeah, you know, Star Wars it will always be uh, remembered for the month of May and the biggest space saga of all time. I think you always remember your first Star Wars movie and, and you know, the circumstances around it, who you saw it with, who took you. I know I do. Uh, oh, for so sure. Star Wars is special to everybody. Um, I did this one for Frank. 2004 cult romantic film, The Notebook, premieres. You know, Frank is, is a big fan of The Notebook, so shout out to Frank. Uh, the Notebook is almost 20 years old. He probably watched it this week in celebration anniversary with his box of tissues and his little uh, candies. And yes. Ate little candies and drank a little wine and had yeah, some tissues. His, his, ben and, his uh, Ben and Jerry's ice cream or his yeah. Mike and Ike's. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and... Uh, Good for Frank in the notebook. <laughs> 1985, A View to Kill, the 14th James Bond film and the last film to star Roger Moore, also starring Christopher Walken, premiered in San, in San Francisco. I was going to say that was a Christopher Walken one. Yeah, I didn't realize he played a, a, a Bond villain. I yeah. guess I haven't seen A View to Kill. It's, 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 okay. it's okay. I mean, you're not messing nothing with that one. Uh, Roger Moore at that point was very similar to Connery. He was about done with it, um, kind of mailed it in. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, and that's why they moved on a couple of years later with the Living Daylights and Timothy Dalton, um, who I still think was not given enough films. He I, was the Daniel Craig before Daniel Craig. Yeah, he was a brutal James yeah. Bond. I mean, License to Kill is terrible, but it's a brutal film. Yes, I mean it's not. It's probably one Fucking of the worst. It's people. probably one of the worst James <laughs> Bond films made. But yeah, Dalton's and Dalton was good, and he just uh, they moved on again after Dalton did just two films. Um, but uh, yeah, well, they wanted Brosnan all along, right? And they couldn't okay. get him in '87. And when they remade, when they redid his contract for Remington Steel, they couldn't get him, so they won't right. call him. And uh, yeah, no, you're right. He was kind of the fill in. So 1985, Ronald Reagan awards Jimmy Stewart the Presidential Medal of Freedom and promotes him to Major General on the retired list. Of course, James Stewart did. Uh, it's a Wonderful Life. One of the um, greatest Smith. screen actors of all time. Yes. I will always argue he's one of my favorites. I don't talk about him a lot Served on the show. The Air Force. But, I mean, uh, I would love to cover Fly to the Phoenix on the show if it's available streaming. Such a classic movie. Mr. Smith goes to Washington. They made us watch in school, so he yes. understood what a filibuster was. Um, Broken Arrow, which is a great Western he was in. Um, of course, he did some Hitchcock movies, Vertigo, and a couple things. I mean, Jimmy Stewart is... I mean, just he did that one film, Jimmy Valance, the uh, the uh, Jimmy Valance, Jimmy no uh, Liberty Valance, Liberty Valance, yeah, yeah, with the uh, with the Duke, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, Stewart is iconic, just one of the greatest of all time, and utmost respect. Always so good on the screen. Yes, um, he just man, just an amazing, amazing actor. Enough said, man. Um, a little somber note, nineteen ninety five. Actor Christopher Reeve is paralyzed from the neck down from falling from a horse in a riding competition in Virginia. I remember this. I was in school. Yeah, that was that was sad. I remember seeing the ninety five, right? You said yeah, I was about 95. to graduate from high school and uh and uh, I remember it was just terrible. Uh you know, and he uh tell you what though, Reeve um took it with a confidence like no other and, and took his yeah disability that was brought upon him and he helped raise awareness and did a lot of charity work in his last years of life, and just uh, just was, uh, showed the amazing man that he was a Superman. Yes, you know from um, and he's and it's why he's always going to be one of the best. Uh, and we unfortunately lost him a few years later to his his paralysis that caused other health issues and things like that. And yeah, that just a damn shame. But you know, he um, he talked about how he had no regrets that you know it he lived a great life and. It could have happened to anybody. It was the uh, it was what was given to him a lot in life. Yeah, man, he get he get to be the uh, the greatest version of Superman. Yeah, that's like ar arguably. I mean, the Christopher Reeve Foundation to this day still raises money for for paralysis victims and things that wow. love that nature. Is is uh, I think his widow is still alive and and she uh, still does it. So that's awesome. Sticking with DC, 
1939, Batman first appears in Detective Comics number 27 this month. Yep, I mean, uh, as much as um, I, I do appreciate Superman and Chris Reeve, but Batman, uh, no secret, that's my favorite superhero of all time. Absolutely number one for me. I mean, Wolverine is a close second on the Marvel side, but Batman is always going to be my number one. Um, just a character that I like so much. <laughs> I mean, I just, I don't know what drew me. I you know, honestly don't know what drew me to him. I just, uh, Batman is just a character I, I really like, and and uh, he's been around a while. We're, you know, God willing, we'll get to see his 100th anniversary. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, that'd be something. Hopefully we <coughs> see something cool for that. Yeah. Um. 1997, staying in the 90s, Austin Powers, International Man of Mystery, starring Mike Myers and Elizabeth Hurley, is released. Obviously a big play uh, off of the Roger Moore era of James no Bond films. that movie, Matt, except for you. Hey, ev <laughs> everyone loves Austin Powers. I mean, it did have Elizabeth Hurley. In it. Yeah, dude, Elizabeth Hurley, Heather Graham, and then you had Beyonce. Um, 2002, Spider-Man, starring Tobey Maguire, Peter Parker, William Defoe as the Green Goblin premieres. Uh, of course, we're talking uh, Sam Raimi before, um, and you def I definitely see a few of his horror elements in this film. Um, that sped up camera um, with the uh, with the uh, wire that um, Spider Man is tied up with at one point. Um, very very cool stuff from. Well, yeah, and then the um, you know the original trailer. Uh, Featured the two towers, of course. Oh, yeah. And uh, I knew it was the anniversary because that trailer always makes the rounds around the anniversary. And it had been around the Internet the last week or so. Uh, people showing off the the trailer, which they say is rare because all copies were pulled from uh, studios and stuff. Yeah. But that doesn't keep the Internet from uh, having it appear, you know. Once it's out there, you can't get rid of it. That's right. And uh, lastly, and on another somber note, 1973. We'll go back a little bit. Bruce Lee collapses in Golden Harvest Studios in Hong Kong and is rushed to Hong Kong Baptist Hospital where doctors diagnose him with cerebral edema. Hmm. And, uh... That's when we lost him. Yeah, yeah, because he didn't make one, he didn't make it much past that, huh, a few hours later. Yeah, the great Bruce Lee, man. They, uh, Arrow Video actually just announced they are releasing a remastered 4K collection of all, you know, because... Of, uh, I think it's most of his films. You know, a lot of people don't know he only appeared like in seven films. Yeah, um, that were well known. I think he appeared in a few other you know Chinese releases. But um, as big as he was, he wasn't in a ton of films. And I think Arrow Video is going to release a box set with all his films in 4K remasters. And some of them, like Game of Death, desperately need a remaster yes. and stuff. So look out for that. Hopefully, Arrow Video does a good job with that um, when it releases. Um, but good deal, Matt. Good job. Good job with the pop culture this month. I like that segment. It's fun. Nice. Yeah. Um, you know, it's always fun to do that every month. And uh, I know we've been kind of not doing as many sub-features this year on the show we did last year. But uh, but um, I think this summer I'm working on some ideas to bring some sub-features back along with pop culture every month. So uh, so we'll see what happens with that. Um, so we got a couple weeks before Compalooza, a couple more episodes to do. And next week we're going to talk a movie that... Um, is uh, pretty wild and from the director of The Last Jedi, um, which is the most controversial film in the Star Wars uh, universe, and that is Rian Johnson. And we're going to talk his time travel crime thriller, how the fuck do you describe this movie? Yeah. But that is Looper. So you're me in 30 years. Sorry, staring into your eyes. It's too strange. And your face looks backwards. Do you know what's gonna happen? You done all this already? As me? I don't want to talk about time travel. We both know how this has to go down. So why don't you do what old men do and die? Why don't you just take your little gun out of between your legs and do it? Boy. Time travel is outlawed, used only in secret by the largest criminal organizations. When they need someone gone and they want to erase any trace of the target ever existing, they use specialized assassins like me, called loopers. <laughs> You're a looper. You know what we do? And the only rule is never let your target escape, even if you target. Is you. This is not 
not a good thing. My boss will be searching for me until he finds me. Sweep the streets. Get on it. I'm going to fix this. I'm going to find it. I'm going to kill it. Hunt them down. But every second that passes is bad. What's he going to do? I'm going to save your life. My life. Your life. I know you're not lying when you say you're going to kill this guy. And this is a cool ass movie. I've only seen it like one time, even though I own it. I need to, and I've, I've, I bought it. This is a movie I bought without seeing because I heard good things about it. So I bought it and I watched it once and I really did like it, but I've never gone back and watched it. And uh, so I'm going to watch it this week for, for the show. And uh, it stars the uh, fantastic Joseph Gordon Levitt. Th- this is a guy who is another, you know, sometimes you get these actors that like, why aren't they bigger stars? Yeah. And, and Joseph Gordon's one of those guys. I just feel like, man, this guy should be bigger. He's so good, you know? I like him, um, man. And, uh, and Bruce Willis is in this, who is, you know, arguably one of Bruce's better roles. Um, you know, because Bruce... Especially in the twilight of his career. Yeah, Bruce isn't yeah. always best known for his acting chops. You know, he kind of plays the same guy in most movies, but he's legitimately really good in Looper. And uh, might be a little bittersweet talking to him as we know Bruce is facing some uh, health issues himself as mm-hmm. he's on the decline. Um, but uh, I'm kind of excited to talk Looper next week on the show and look back at this uh, time traveling crime saga. You know, um, so we'll see. You've seen it before, right? Oh yeah. yeah, yeah, like at least twice. Yeah, I remember having a really. I remember the ending of it being a really great sequence in a cornfield and all that near the farm. Um, so I remember there being some really cool stuff in this. So, so it'll be a fun one to watch on next week's show. And and, and until then, man. Uh, I mentioned earlier in the show, of course, the RebelRadioPodcast.com is our website, and you can find us on iHeartRadio, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, all the, basically anywhere you can listen to podcasts, you'll find us. And, and again, we'll be at Compalooza on Saturday at 2 o'clock from the podcast stage doing our uh, live Indiana Jones show, uh, so come see us out there. Mm-hmm. But until then, thank you as always for listening. We do appreciate it, and uh, just continue to be safe out there. And this has been Mark. This has been Matt. And until next time, remember as always, just just go go there there and do it. it.